Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nikon Creators Hour. My name is Mike Corrado, and I've been with Nikon for 35 years, and I've been taking pictures for over 40 years, and we wanted to bring you epic interviews with legendary photographers and very influential photographers to inspire you uh, over these challenging times. And with us today, we have Mr. George Tiedemann, who is a legendary sports photographer who had a job that every, everyone growing up in photography wanted, uh, being a sports illustrated photographer. And uh, his work is epic, and we're going to see some of his pictures today. Welcome to the Creators Hour, George. How are you? Hi, Mike. Glad to be here. I'm so happy to have you here, and, and thank you for putting together the collection of images that you did. You and I have known each other for decades now through, you know, the events that we've worked on at Nikon, and I'm just so uh, excited to have you share your stories today. How's everything going for you at home with you, your family, your loved ones? Everything's great. You know, it's, it's, uh, I'm a lucky guy, you know, I'm surrounded mm -hmm. by people who uh, I care about and who care about me. How bad can mm -hmm. things be? You know, we're going to, we're going to talk about some of your images, but uh, I always love to start off with letting the audience know a little bit about you and your background and how you got into photography. And I know the first image is going to talk about that a little bit, but just give us a little backstory on how you got excited and interested in becoming a photographer. Well, I was an Air Force brat and being my father was a civilian, we were able to stay much longer than the regular military guys, uh, families. So I was seven years in, in, at Willis Air Force Base in, in Tripoli, Libya. I was 10 years old when I went there, and I was almost 17 when I came home. And they had a base hobby shop there, uh, which was a big advantage. My father uh, also took a lot of pictures of us kids. He bought me uh, a, a, an, ag an old Agatha Bellows camera in the mid-50s, and I started using that and taking pictures uh, you know, at the high school and, and, and uh, so on and so forth. And I uh, would go to the base hobby shop and the airman there would help me, show me how to, to process the film and make prints and so on and so forth. And the Air Force had a little American bandstand kind of thing uh, for their uh, armed forces television, local armed forces television. I would go there and take pictures. Uh, I, mean, I was pretty heavily into sports, but I still, Took, took pictures, and uh, I, it was a start. So it got me interested in it. But mm -hmm. uh, then when I came back to the States, that kind of ended it. And, um, you know, later on, I got involved again. It's, uh, I want to mention it again, like, Back in the day, you know, everybody wanted to be working for Sports Illustrated. I want to admit to having one picture published in Sports Illustrated, but it was part of an ad, and it was about the size of my thumbnail, but I was still so excited to get, like, those little bits of ink in the magazine. It was either Sports Illustrated or National Geographic. And we're going to go through uh, a bunch of images you put together, and uh, I know the first couple. Let me launch the program, and uh, we'll pull up that first picture and uh, start the slideshow. Uh, first couple have really nothing to do with sports, uh, but are obviously important to your, your uh, career and journey in photography. So uh, talk about the picture, George. Give us the backstory here. Well, this, this picture was uh, of guys in my outfit uh, jumping on a mission in Vietnam in uh, 1966, uh, summer of 66. And... Uh, I, uh, prior to that, during training, uh, back in the States, I snuck a little, uh, Kodak Instamatic in my jacket as, as I was on an, uh, a, a practice jump and that got me interested again in photography. So, uh, when I got to Vietnam, one of the first things I did was to stop at the PX and buy myself a good 35 millimeter. And, uh, I would take it when I wasn't actively involved, meaning like jumping out the door, or that kind of stuff. Uh, I would use it and uh, I got, it was, it was interesting because it was just interesting pictures to be made. And, and that's uh, what I did. I just uh, uh, have, a, have a collection. I wish I had known then what I know, knew not much later, I'd have taken more. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, I, I was so interested in it. I, asked the Marine Corps photographer, what are the, you know, what are the chances of me uh, switching over to photography? And uh, he gave me, you know, he told me a few things, which he wasn't authorized to do anything. But when I thought about it, I thought that, you know what, 
I don't feel real comfortable pointing a picture at somebody, pointing a camera at somebody who's pointing a rifle at me. So I, mm -hmm. I kind of nixed that idea. <laughs> yeah, very, very dangerous conditions in conflict photography. Um, and you had mentioned to me before in conversation that uh, you, you said this kind of got you back into photography. So I guess you started, you know, early on with that Bellows camera. You kind of let it go for a little bit, and then you now become inspired in this situation with a little camera, you know, in a very critical situation, which is an amazing story to tell. Um, I know uh, that uh, there's a really cool picture here of Janis Joplin. Um, talk about this, and I think this is one that kind of got you back into photography pretty heavily, no? Yeah, I, uh, I kind of uh, started freelancing. I actually started in newspapers in the circulation department. Mm -hmm. And I would take a camera with me and, 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 and take pictures while I was out and submit them and so on and so forth. So that uh, lasted about six months in circulation. And then uh, the editor, uh, Simon editor, was interested in what I was doing and so he uh, gave me a job as uh, as a staffer but prior to that I had been given a few freelance assignments and this was one of them now I must admit that I was a uh, a uh, Johnny Mathis and uh, Barbara Streisand fan and I knew nothing about Janis Joplin so anyway, I show up at the convention hall in Asbury Park to, 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 to photograph her. And I have to admit, I was kind of freaked out because I, I, uh, to, look, to see what was going on on stage and then look at the crowd behind me, uh, I asked myself, what the heck happened in the four years I was gone? You know, it just, it, it was an adjustment. Um, I was happy to do the assignment and, and I'm, I'm no one to judge, you know, what they were doing. I, it just was something I hadn't experienced before. And, and, uh, it was, uh, crazy. That was all. Well, this, this is an epic picture of an epic musician singer. And, um, uh, obviously it's a big part of what you presented to us today. Uh, how does that make you feel now you're realizing this is Janis Joplin. You may not have known it at the time, but uh, this is one of the most iconic figures in music. Yeah. Uh, along the way, you know, you come across things. If you're not in the, if you, if you're not in the game, you, 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 you won't experience it. And I just kind of like accepted what came my way and just tried to do the best I could with it. Okay. Uh, I, I've, I've, said this and, and, and I subscribe to this theory. The most important assignment I've ever done is the one I'm doing right now, okay? The minute you uh, uh, take an assignment lightly, you're shortchanging yourself and you're shortchanging the subject you're photographing. So uh, this, like anything else, uh, I, I just, uh, approached it with interest and tried to do the best I could and used what photographic skills I had to, uh, which back then was, was limited, but, uh, you know, I did the best I could. Well said. Beautiful. Um, another image from the days, uh, obviously, journalist your entire career um, for Sports Illustrated and other news organizations. What's going on here? This is probably <laughs> a pretty devastating thing to have witnessed. Well, I worked for newspapers, the Asbury Park Press to start with, then I went to the Courier Post in Camden, and then I went to the Philadelphia Bulletin. And I spent about three years at each place. Um, in this particular situation here, I was, it was towards the end of my newspaper career, and I, uh, I was on the Walt Whitman Bridge, and this was back in the days of the CBs. Then I had one and to just see what was going on, and, and I'm going into Philadelphia on the bridge and I hear somebody talking about a plane crash at Philadelphia International Airport. So I quickly diverted and he started heading in that direction. Well, I came in by the um, uh, private jet entrance and I just, I, I, I don't know, I, 
I've learned a lot of times the worst thing you can do is ask for permission because <laughs> the easiest thing for somebody to tell you is no, you can't do it. So I drove onto the airport, saw off in the distance what was that where the, the fire trucks were, drove down the runway, got out of my car, figured I needed, took, obviously, I, I, I think I took a few lenses with me, but the full frame fish was the one that worked best and jumped up on the fire truck and uh, made the picture from up on top of the fire truck. Now, did I just go up on the fire truck without asking? I don't recall. Uh, somebody might have said, yeah, go ahead. But the likelihood is I would have been told no. So I, I got up there, made the picture turned around and left. Luckily, there were, I believe, 200, 102 passengers or something like that, and uh, nobody was killed, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the plane aborted the landing and went, accelerated to take off. Uh, I read the, uh, the uh, FAA's report on it, and when it accelerated to take off, the tail hit the ground and broke the back section off, and you know, this is the result of it. But the uh, Philadelphia Bulletin uh, editor liked it so much that they ran it from from side to side across the, right under the masthead. Uh, you know. it's it's nice to hear that uh, nobody uh, died during that crash. Um, oh yeah, beautiful image and what a what a great story. Let's talk about sports now. Before you jump into this picture, it's, you mentioned something before about being in the front and then looking back and seeing the crowd behind you. And I think as a photographer, and I've heard this before, it's like a front row seat to the world, essentially. And then you bring that story to everybody from your point of view and your perspective. Um, talk a little bit about why sports photography became so important to you after your days as a journalist. And then let's get into this picture of Pele. Well, I... When I was with the, the first paper, I was with the Asbury Park Press, I, st I started doing some freelance st stuff that was recognized by the NFL, and the NFL contacted me and asked me if I would, if I would be a contributing photographer. And of course, what was I going to say? No, of course I did. So I would, if I wasn't working on a Sunday, I would go to the games and take pictures and submit them to them. Well, that drew the attention of somebody else in soccer, and they contacted me and asked me if I would do the same thing for them that I was doing for the NFL. So I switched over and uh, I mean, I played soccer as a kid uh, and, and loved the game. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, the Philadelphia uh, Adams uh, asked me to, to do some work for them. So I did that. Uh, and then the league, the North American Soccer League, uh, hired me to to do work for them, which he let, eventually led to a staff job as director of photography at the North American Soccer League. But uh, uh, it, it and and that recognition and and that exposure led to SI when they started uh, uh, covering soccer and um, uh, looking looking for somebody who, who kind of like knew the sport. That certainly doesn't mean that there weren't other people who couldn't do it, but they were busy doing their thing. And quite frankly, with the, the space that soccer got, uh, you know, there might not have been an interest for other people to want to do it. Uh, they were busy. So uh, I accepted it and uh, got involved. So anyway, this, this particular picture here was, was Pele's final game. And uh, uh, it was a madhouse to say the least. The stadium was absolutely packed with, with, with fans. And I like my pictures to tell a story. And shooting from ground level, especially when you're five foot six, and you're shooting up with somebody on top of somebody else's on top of the shoulders of somebody else, you're going to get sky and, and, and stuff that really doesn't add to the picture. So uh, I held, I took a 28 millimeter, pre-focused it, I think about 12 feet, 15 feet, and 
held it over my head and waded waded into the crowd and made you know 36 exposures uh and uh i was somewhat lucky i think uh to me the picture of of him looking up at the sky is almost is is kind of, and with the cross around his neck is is somewhat spiritual to me it's like he's looking up at god and of course he has the brazilian flag from which, from where he came and the american flag uh um showing appreciation for for where he was so it was uh and in the background you see uh, players like uh, Beckenbauer and, and Hunt and, and uh, Shep Messing and, 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 and a, a number of the other uh, team members. So this angle to told a lot more about what was going on than uh, shooting at ground level, pointing the camera up with the sky in the background. I'm going to tap upon my memory. Was he, he was playing for the New York Cosmos at the time, right? Right, right. And, and where, was, where was this taken? It was a stadium? giant stadium. Mm -hmm. The Cosmos held the attendance record at Giant Stadium for years. I'd have to go back and check what the record is, but it was like seventy-six thousand plus in at at, at uh, you know not at, at one particular game. I mean, it was it was exciting. I'm not going to say it wasn't. It was exciting. People were into it. Uh, it was it was a great time. It was a festive time. You know, people enjoyed it. And he was he was like the Pied Piper. I mean, he he loved everybody. He was uh, gracious. He was kind. Uh, he was just a real. I'm getting chills talking about it. But he was just a a nice man. And uh, I appreciated the time that I was able to spend around him. So that's beautiful, George. Truly beautiful. Another soccer image. Talk about this one. Well, the technique is pretty much the same, and the reasoning for the camera position is exactly the same. This was at the World Cup in Argentina. This was the my bi first big assignment for SI, and this was uh, in 1978. And this was Daniel Passarella being paraded around the field by uh, fans and teammates holding up the World Cup trophy. This was my, my, my first cover for SI, and I, I could be wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong. I probably should have checked. I think this was SI's first uh, World Cup cover. But regardless, uh, the same thing happened here, except here, it was much more dangerous. These people were rabid. I mean, it was, they were so excited. And, and again, 28 millimeter over my head, pre-focused. Uh, the lighting conditions were terrible uh, back then. Uh, we were shooting this with 200 ISO ectochrome push to stop. You know, think about it today. You'd go in there and set the ISO at 5,000, and it's cool. <laughs> but, but not back then. I mean... You were shooting action at 250th of a second sometimes because the light was so bad, wide open. I remember uh, uh, situations uh, where where it was it, it was really bad, you know. Uh, and and stadium to stadium because uh, there were games all over the country uh, varied in in in, in, in lighting. Uh, uh, the amount of lighting that you had. So it was certainly was a challenge. Uh, but uh, this particular picture, I was told to stay behind and photograph the celebration while the other two team, team members, Manny Milan and, and uh, Jerry Cook, who was a picture editor, headed off to Buenos Aires to take the film in to get it processed so they could make the deadlines in, in New York and uh, uh, transmit their selections and so on and so forth. And Jerry was on a flight that night into Miami, connecting into Miami, going on into Chicago. It was, it was insane. Well, anyway, uh, after I made these pictures, uh, this particular picture, uh, I, there was no lo stopping to load your camera. If you stopped, they ran over you. So I retreated, got out of the herd, and then loaded my camera, and then it was 
virtually impossible to get back in there. There were so many people. There was moats around the stadium to keep fans off the stadium. Their moats didn't stop them. <laughs> they, they were on the field. Anyway, um, so I got the I, I left the stadium and uh, hitchhiked, literally hitchhiked back into downtown Buenos Aires uh, and, and, and got to the lab and uh, walked in the door and Jerry said to me, what are you doing here? I said, it was all over. I just figured I'd get back here. And well, I made it in time for the last film drop. And uh, that was lucky because otherwise this picture would have been seen the following at the end of the year in the year end uh, special issue. But as it was, I made the last film drop. Uh, this was the, uh, a selection that was sent back to the States and was chosen for, a, for the cover. Anyway. I I don't want to understate this because back in the day of shooting, you were manually focusing. <laughs> the gift of autofocus today makes it a little bit easier for photographers. You still have to follow the action. But here, like you said, you had to pre-focus the 28 millimeter uh, at, at, at whatever f-stop at 200 ISO film, push to stop, right? So right. maybe you're getting about 400 ISO worth out of it, where nowadays 5,000, 6,400 is right. almost commonplace. So a lot right. of challenges back then. So anybody tuning in, I think this is a testament to George's work and his, uh, his abilities, his talent as a sports photographer to be able to get this stuff done. And it's, it's amazing too, how you say everybody rushed the field and um, it's amazing how that's transitioned as well as now I, I know at uh, Shea stadium and other stadiums that I witnessed all of a sudden, you know, the police come in on horses and they, they started to prevent that or stop that from happening um, so the teams can celebrate, you know, without the fans rushing on. So a lot has changed since then. But how do you feel? I mean, it's your first Sports Illustrated cover. What's, what's going on with you emotionally? Uh, I was happy, of course, and it was a complete surprise to me. They, they called me over to the office in Buenos Aires, and, and uh, Clive Gammon was, was the writer, the soccer writer for the magazine, was there and Clive said to me uh, he said you know that you made the cover and I was like uh, pleasantly surprised and happy but I wasn't doing backflips I was just you know I mean it was nice it was nice uh, probably uh, if I had gotten a phone call I would have shown a little bit more excitement but I tried to be a little professional about it <laughs> but you know like this picture here I mean it was shot wide open I mean, I, I, I probably have the same lens down, downstairs in my safe, and I think it's a 28-millimeter F2 lens, okay? And, uh, I mean, you know, that, that's what you did. You shot wide open so you could keep the, maintain the quality, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, you, had to, you had to stay within certain parameters, and, 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 and otherwise your stuff would be garbage. Uh, you to maintain the quality was a, was an absolute challenge. So, I bet. Olympics, what's going on here? Uh, yeah, this is in Athens uh, in uh, two thousand four. Uh, I didn't shoot this for SI. Uh, by that time, I was. Um, Still working for SI, but uh, less. Uh, and uh, I uh, felt that in, in a career with sports photography, if there was one place I wanted to be or felt I needed to be, it was in Athens, where it all started. So um, Jimmy Colton, who was the... Uh, was an editor at SI arranged uh, for me to get an assignment from an agency so uh, I could go. And uh, I will be eternally grateful to Jimmy because uh, uh, it, uh, it was quite a, a, a venture. And uh, having been there was, was something special. But uh, I had a credential to go upstairs uh, to, to be at the opening ceremonies, and uh, uh, we weren't allowed to take tripods. So the only thing we had was with monopod. Well, on my monopod, I learned a trick from other guys at the magazine, was to 
put some gaffer tape around your monopod so if you ever needed it, you had it. So at the top of the stadium, they had a good solid uh, railing. So I taped my monopod to the railing to give me the stability that I needed to make these time exposures. And in this particular picture, I took a number of pictures from here. It's very similar to this and, and all of them were interesting and beautiful. And, but this one here was, was luck. Meaning that when I started this time exposure, the fireworks on the far left and far right of this picture just started. Well, in sequence, all of the other went off. It was, it was almost magical. It just went right on around the stadium and lit the whole place. It was an accident. I had nothing to do with it, you know. But you know what? If you're not there, you'll never get it. So uh, this was just one of those situations. Uh, it, it, it was a problem uh, because the exposure was so it was so overexposed because of the light, the software had to pull it back almost two stops. But if it had been in the days of uh, film, uh, you just throw this one in the garbage. But uh, the software was able to save it. And uh, thank you, software. <laughs> I'd love to give a shout out to Jimmy. He, Jimmy Colton is uh, one of the premier editors in the business. And uh, I met him at the Eddie Adams workshop. He's Uncle Jimmy there, and he's just one of the most genuine people out there. So, Jimmy, we, we say hello if you're tuning in. Did you cover other events here? Obviously, just not the opening ceremonies. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, wrestling is a passion of mine. I was a wrestler in high school, and uh, uh, I made sure that I covered that. Um, I found the, 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 the women's wrestling to be very interesting. And boy, were they talented. I mean, it was, uh, but that was one of the things that, that I covered. I covered some track and field. I did not have a credential for the field, but I shot some stuff from the, from the side. Uh, I, I will admit that my uh, access was, was limited because I didn't have the, the highest priority credentials. I shot uh, uh, swimming uh, from the stands. Uh, I shot bicycling. I shot uh, uh, what was it called? Dressage. Anyway, uh, I, sh I shot some of that. Uh, I tried to spread it around women's volleyball. Uh, I'm sure I forgot some, but I was busy. You know, every day it was something. Or I, I carried, and this is without exaggeration, 50 pounds of gear with me the whole day when you would go, because you would go from one assignment to the next, okay, or one event to the next. You didn't have time to go back, so you took whatever, what you possibly, what you might possibly need with you. And uh, I, I, I will say that it was, it was an exhausting event to cover. So I could imagine. There was very little, there was very little sleep, and some of the sleep took place in the press room because by the time you got back, processed the stuff, there was no point in going back to your room, okay, because you'd be going at it in another three hours, so you just stay right there. Yeah, anyway. I've heard that from so many Olympic photographers that have covered it over weeks' times, and it is an exhausting thing. So while everybody's sitting at home saying, wow, my God, what a great job that is, it is a very, very difficult uh, thing to do over the weeks that you're there. I think I met you at the first event. It possibly could have been sports, this um, auto racing, car racing. Uh, this seemed to be something you did a lot of. Talk about your, your journey with uh, motorsports. Well, I considered myself a team player at the magazine. I did pretty much what they asked me to do. Okay. I didn't ham and haw and I got to do a football game. I got to do this baseball game. I did what they asked me to do. And there were plenty of guys who shot baseball and plenty of guys who shot football. And uh, so they weren't so interested maybe in shooting some of the other stuff. And motorsports was, was one that, that uh, needed, might have needed help. So 
I kind of like fell into it. What they asked me to do, I would do. Okay. Uh, I uh, there was a Super Bowl that Barbara Hinkle, a picture editor at the time, asked me to to do, and it was probably my first Super Bowl, and she wanted me to shoot it from the stands because the person that she had assigned to do it in the stands didn't want to do it in the stands. So that made an opening for me. Well, I wasn't going to tell Barbara, no, I'm not going to do it. I, you know, of course I did it. Look, you never know where the picture's going to come from. You know, uh, during the World Series in Atlanta, uh, I got a cover out of there from a gondola over, overlooking a home plate. Who the heck wants to be in a gondola? You know, be in the dugouts where you get the real stuff. Well, you know what? This was a different angle, different picture, and it worked out for me. You know, uh, so I wound up uh, getting motorsports, and and the, so a lot of the characters in, in motorsports were were interesting guys. This this is Dale Earnhardt uh, during a practice session late in the afternoon at Charlotte Motor Speedway. And back then, uh, there were a few of the drivers who didn't wear full face helmets, uh, and uh, it was always a challenging thing to try to get the face be it who's in the car and um, that had to be done either late afternoon or early morning and usually late afternoon during the final practice when the sun was low and obviously it had to be a bright day so that's what I would do I'd trek on out the turn uh, turn three and try to get them uh, coming out of the turn and get some good light on it. The same thing in Indianapolis. Indianapolis uh, was the same thing. You're shooting uh, late afternoon stuff coming out of, uh, coming out of turn three uh, and uh, trying to get their eyes underneath the sun, sun visors, which was a, a trick, you know, to accomplish. Uh, it was just trying to make it a little different. And, and you know, back then, you know, I mean, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but uh, you had to shoot this thing at least at a thousandth of a second or higher, okay? And uh, even at a thousandth of a second and higher, a race car moves uh, several inches, okay? So it's it's certainly a challenge to get get it sharp. Is anything, well, a challenge. Anything? Challenge for focus. Challenge for exposure. And remember, remember. 36 frames at oh, probably yeah. a frame rate maximum of six frames per second with a motor drive. If I remember back then in the heyday of, of yeah. professional sports cameras like the uh, F3 or. Well, in a case like this, you, you would just, I just pick a spot on the track. There was, there was no way you're going to, you're going to follow focus. So I just pick a spot on the track and let them come to that spot and just be ready and bang off a couple of frames. Bang, bang. That's it. It's gone. You know, I mean, these guys at 200 miles an hour, they're moving, they're moving a football field a second. Okay. <laughs> your, your, your timing has got to be down. I recall one photographer said to me one time, he says, how many pictures, you sharp pictures you get out of, out of these shots on the turn. And this guy did it a lot. And I said, well, I don't know, maybe if I get four or five, you know, I'll be happy. You know, well, you know, I get about 32. <laughs> and I mean, I, the guy was a friend of mine and I didn't say anything, but, you know, I, I think a lot of that has to do is what's your perception of sharp, you know? Uh, and uh, I, 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 I try to keep my standards pretty high when it comes to, you know, the subject being sharp. Anyway, Very much sharp. He was, he was, a, he was quite a guy. I really enjoyed him. Uh, anyhow. Oh, this was a, another uh, exciting moment. This was uh, at the world championships right outside of Paris. And uh, let me see, let me look at my notes here. Uh, was in 2003, and this was the decathlon uh, 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 javelin throw. And I didn't have a spot on the field. I was 
able to shoot from the stands, but the stands, the backgrounds were pretty ugly. And you see all that stuff behind him? Well, there, that's a bench and so on and so forth. And it was just, it just distract. It was a distraction to what was actually going on. So I went to Nikon and borrowed a 400 millimeter lens and uh, put a 2x extender on it. And I shot uh, these athletes throwing the javelin. Most of the stuff I shot at a 40th of a second. This particular picture here was shot at a 25th of a second at like, I think it was uh, F11 or F16, something like that, probably at, at 100 ISO. And I was really pleased with the results because if you look at the tip of the spear, the tip of the spear is sharp as a tack. And it, just, it was just a matter of, of, of timing and, 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 and uh, having the, the, the courage <laughs> to, to attempt something like this because it, it certainly wasn't something that, that's written in the books on how to, how to shoot sports action. But uh, I was really happy with it. There were a number of these that came out quite well. I was surprised. But you, you, you've got to pick these guys up when they, when they start their, their, their trot into – into the throwing area and just stay with them. And, you know, it worked out. And, I didn't, have, and I didn't have an ugly background. Yeah. yeah, you talked about it before, you know, the high angle position with the Dale Earnhardt, or Earnhardt photo and then other high angles you've taken. Yeah, there's a big advantage to that, you know, because you do have a cleaner view. Um, you know, sometimes when you're down low on the field, I can't tell you how many butts and obstructions I photographed trying to get to the main subjects because at that angle, although there's an advantage there for, especially when someone's jumping, you see the elevation, there's a lot more likelihood that you're going to get blocked by somebody. So, but this is really challenging too, because high speed action at slow shutter speeds means a lot more of a challenge, I think, in trying to create something like this. And you did it so well. Uh, beautiful, beautiful image. Uh, it turns, to me, it turns it into um, uh, somewhat of a painting as as a, a photograph, it just mm -hmm. you know, the colors just seem to, to to blend together and streak. I I I like this kind of stuff. I I covered an I went to an NFL football game specifically to shoot nothing but slow mo action, and I'm telling you, the stuff that came out of there was really interesting. I'm not saying a lot of publishers were interested in the pictures. I'm just saying the pictures were interesting. You lost a lot, but you know what? Like I said before, it's not about what you lost. It's about what you've got. What Absolutely. You Absolutely. And, and like you said, the motion is just seen a bit differently. Frozen action would be great, but the motion and flow within an image, I, I guess it would be considered sports fine art at that point. Well, it's, 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 it's fun. Yep. The results are fun. And this is another tack sharp image with a beautiful background out of focus. Talk about this image obviously taken in Paris. Yeah, I mean, this was at the same event. Um, this young lady is from Italy, and uh, I did have a field credential at this point, but I couldn't get back very far to use anything long, and where I decided to shoot from was relatively close to, to, to the, uh, the landing pit. And... Uh, but I didn't like the background. The background was too sharp. So I broke out my old uh, knocked knee core 1.2 lens, which I bought back in the early 80s on my way to England to photograph bo boxing. Uh, and I, I put that on and shot this at 1.2, pre-focused, and uh, it worked out fine because I don't have any any distractions in the background that are going to take away from her effort and uh, again you're going to lose some I'm not I'm not ignorant I know that it, the chances of getting it are slim but they're not none so I I, I took a chance and, and and there were quite a few quite a few images that were, were not bad but but she was uh, 
her her motion, her expressions, and so on and so forth, just um, enhanced the photograph. So the, I, the energy is so big, and of course, the jubilation or the jump, uh, whatever's happening in this moment, uh, I think it's a jump then. But the just everything, like you said, blurring that background is so important because if people are taken to the background, it diminishes the foreground. And at one point too, you did an incredible job of of getting her sharp, even, you know, whether you're pre-focused or not. I mean, the detail in, in, in her physique is phenomenal. What a great moment. Well, it's, uh, it's using, using the equipment to your advantage. Okay. I mean, they make great, great, uh, lenses and, and cameras and, uh, just using them properly, uh, is 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 not a challenge it's a, it's a pleasure amen to that so you finish your career as a working sports photographer but it doesn't end there um i i you and i both know johnny iacona um and and some of the other si guys other sports photographers uh that we've worked with through the years johnny never stops taking pictures he still shows up at events he's He's just a machine. And I talk to him and local photographers here like Paul Bear as well. And, and they say it's just, they love doing it so much that they can't stop. They just love to shoot pictures. But you've kind of shifted gears more towards, uh, I guess, things that are closer to you now in your life. Talk about that. Well, I've got 10 grandchildren and all of them are active. They all have some passion or something that they do. And, uh, I just enjoy it. First off, I can't imagine being uh, a young person and, 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 and having a bunch of pictures. I mean, I was involved in sports in school all the time. I was, you know, every, you know, soccer, wrestling, baseball, blah, blah, blah. Every, every season I was there, you know, and, and to, to have pictures like these, of me when I was doing it would be something really special. I mean, I gotta, I gotta dig around to find anything at all, but, uh, my grandkids will, will, uh, you know, have, uh, have a nice collection of, of their sporting careers. If you want to call it that at an, at a young age. In fact, I told, uh, uh, a couple of my granddaughters, three of my granddaughters who play a lot of golf and they're very good. And I told him, you might revive my career if, you, if you're good enough to get on the LPGA. You might find me walking around uh, <laughs> the course photographing you. Mm -hmm. So, or the women's national soccer team, you know. I mean, these, these kids are good. Okay? And it's not good because they're my grandkids. They're just they're, they're passionate about what they do. So it's fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just, it, it's, it's so amazing to me. And. Uh, as we start to wind this down, George, um, talk a little bit about this journey and how much it shifted from when you started in sports photography to what's going on today in the way of technologies and things like that. Because you mentioned things, you know, back in the day that, um, again, the crowds and uh, jumping onto the field, that can't happen anymore. Restricted access is a given. There are far more photographers, I think, out there today than there were. Um, talk about a bit of uh, some of the changes from when you started to what's happening now. Well, one epic moment was I was covering an NCAA basketball, um, not championship, but, but one of the games leading up to it. And we were all sitting down by the basket where we normally do. And the TV guy got up and walked right in front of us. And we were all like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, because he's blocking our view. He turned around and looked at us, and he said, we own this. End of discussion. <laughs> we own it. You know, you're going to have to put up with this. You didn't pay for this event. We did. Okay? So it kind of like made you think that, well, you know what? Maybe I better find a different way of doing this. In some cases, you couldn't. Okay? But maybe we need to find, a, or maybe I need to find a different way of doing this 
so I'm not being blocked by uh, cheer other people who are doing their job. Mm -hmm. I'm not condemning them for doing their job. They're doing what they're supposed to do, just as we are. But you don't want to get blocked and 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 out of it, you know. So uh, you know, it's it's it's. Earlier in, in the day, you could get away with a lot more, okay? Now it's, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, uh, like I said, one of the things you didn't want to do is ask for permission because the easiest thing for somebody in security to do is to say no. So if you just try to blend in with the crowd, and what I never did was, uh, opposed to some people, if somebody told me I couldn't do such and such, I didn't argue with them. I just turned around and left because once they remember you, you're done. Okay. Just don't let them remember you and go find a different way to do this. Even a lot of times you had credentials that were, that allowed you to be in a certain position and you can't go here. Okay. You can't argue with them. Okay. Just find another way to do it. So, and, and, and going back to the days of focus, you know, back in, I think it was in the early nineties when autofocus came into play before autofocus sports photographers had job security. And that was their ability to focus these long lenses and keep it. In, it's sharp. There were a limited number of people who could do that. When autofocus came along, <clears throat> sorry, there went our job security. <laughs> you know? Well, it certainly, certainly opened up the playing field a little bit, but I'm telling you, George, looking at your work and, and, and the epic work you've done, there's still that talent of the person behind that camera knowing where to go, knowing where to point the camera, knowing what to shoot, and being creative enough uh, to make it happen. I'm going to bring you back full screen here so people can see you big and bright and happy. And uh, there you go. Um, the, uh, George, uh, I can't thank you enough for giving us your time and these amazing stories. Uh, again, I've known you for a long time, so it's even nice to see you and catch up with you. Um, as we do end here, any, any tips you would give to anyone trying to start out in sports photography, uh, what would you tell them to do? Be patient and persistent, okay? Because it takes patience to get there and persist persistence to get noticed or to, to accomplish the job. I mean, there, there are a number of people out there, okay? Um, who, uh, you know, can do a nice job. You've got to figure out how to do it. Not necessarily better because they do do a good job, a lot of them, but just do it differently. Okay, do it differently. Uh, I'll go back to uh, a NASCAR picture, uh, which we didn't show, but it was Richard Petty's last day at Daytona. And he was saying goodbye to the fans on the, on the stage. And I looked over the situation, and I, eh, I don't want to be in there with the rest of the photographers because they're all at the base looking up. And behind Richard Petty is nothing but the sky or a NASCAR billboard. So I got a hold of the PR guy and I said, listen, can I be up on the stage behind him in an obscure area so I can get the grandstands in the back who those people are his fans. So I got the permission. And when Richard Petty went up on the stage and was saying goodbye, he, he, he had that, uh, infamous or that famous cowboy hat on and, of course, his racing outfit, and uh, so there was no question who he was. And he stretched his arms out to the to the fans, and there was my picture of Richard Petty thanking his fans. And the fans were in the stands, so you had this big, massive stand area. And down below, the photographers made it more important because you saw a mass of photographers down there photographing him, and they wouldn't be photographing him if it wasn't an event. So. It worked out all the way around for me. I had a nice picture uh, that, that said a lot. I didn't have his face. 
I didn't need his face. Okay, if you didn't know who he was from the back, well, then you wouldn't appreciate the picture anyway. So mm -hmm. think about what you're doing and just try to do it a little differently. Sometimes Absolutely. you can't. Sometimes you can't. Yeah. But at least give it a but try. Breaking away from the crowd, you got all those photographers shooting from that one side, you oh. got the unique picture, and that's the difference, is doing it differently. Absolutely. Well, think about it. At the, at the Olympics, 100-meter dash, okay, there are 100 photographers there. They all got several cameras and maybe even more than several, all hooked up, and everybody's pushing the button at the same time. Why would they want your picture? They got thousands of pictures of the same thing. Go to the side. Do it different. Put the camera on the ground. Do something. Just don't, you know, don't do what everybody else is doing. Well, yeah. that's some great advice to close on, George. George, I can't thank you enough for giving us time again. For me personally, it's great to see you. Um, you look amazing. Uh, I, I'm glad you're enjoying photographing your 10 grandkids because that's, uh, that's a great thing to be able to do. And, and your stories are, are just so epic, and, and the advice you give is tremendous. So thank you, George, for putting this collection of images together and spending some time with us. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun, and I'm very fortunate to have been able to do what I've uh, chosen to do. So thanks, and thanks to Nikon. You're welcome. <laughs> Guys tuning in, thank you guys again for showing up and watching this interview with George Tiedemann, uh, a epic Sports Illustrated photographer, sports photographer. It was nice to see his career. We're here to inspire you, um, especially during the challenging times, and we hope that you get out there and shoot pictures. You are inspired by George and anyone else you may have seen uh, during the Creators Hour interviews. Uh, we want everybody to be safe out there. For Nikon, I am Mike Corrado. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll see you soon.